This episode brought to you by Stamps.com. Why go to the store to get stamps when you can have them printed right at home for your convenience? Ladies and gentlemen, behold the outcast, the creepy and depraved, the bizarre creations not meant for the normal world. Embrace the twisted weirdness of Freak Show Cinema! When I started doing Freak Show Cinema, I had a lot of ideas of what films I wanted to cover. When I asked the audience what they wanted me to talk about, though, a lot of people overwhelmingly said, Nine. As I had a picture of it when I was talking about future possibilities. I'll be honest, I kinda put that picture in there as kind of a placeholder. I was gonna talk about it, but it wasn't at the top of the list for me. After so many people recommended it, though, I did realize something strange about the movie. It's one of the few films that everyone I asked had a similar reaction to. They remember it, and don't remember it at the same time. What do I mean by that? Well, I recall seeing the film when it was released in 2009. I even remember how rushed it might have been to make this gimmicky deadline. It has some big-name producers behind it like Tim Burton and Tim Rippick Mammatov, a decent lineup of talented actors, and some rather eye-catching visuals. In fact, the imagery is what stayed with me despite not seeing it for 11 years. I remember these rag dolls with zippers, each having a giant number on their back. I remember it being the apocalypse if it was ran by Sid's toys. I remember this freaky image of one of the dead dolls being used as a hypnotizing device. And I remember a giant monster rising up to Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Arguably, those are very difficult things to forget, but what's so odd is, I don't remember anything else about it. I didn't remember what their numbers meant, nor what the characters were like, or what caused the apocalypse. I couldn't even recall how it ended. What intrigued me was, when I talked to other people about it, they remembered and forgot the exact same things I did. The dolls with the zippers, some of the monsters, somewhere over the rainbow, and nothing else. Online, however, was a very different story. There's several videos that talk about what the film means and the dozens of ways it can be interpreted. So I became kind of fascinated in this movie people did and didn't remember, thus I moved it up on the list. Now, watching it over a decade later, I found the visuals have become a bit more standard compared to modern dark media, the ideas have become much more interesting, and the story and characters... Got beautiful home here. I guess I should start by explaining what the film is even about. Directed by Shane Acker and based on his short film, Nine begins with a ragdoll waking up and discovering a dead scientist, which goes perfectly with the dead world that surrounds him. He has a Nine on his back, so he calls himself Nine and discovers another ragdoll named Two. He gives him a voice box so he can talk, a voice supplied by Elijah Wood, and Two is voiced by Martin Lando. But robotic monsters attack, capture Two, and Nine hides with other ragdolls who explain they're all that's left of, well, pretty much life. Tell me if you've heard this one. Machines have taken over the world from mankind. And that snobby businesswoman might have her heart warmed in that Christmas rom-com. Yeah, nothing that new, but stick with it. Nine wants to go rescue two from the machines, but the ragdoll's leader, one, played by Christopher Plummer, says it's best to stay away to preserve their survival. With the help of a more simple doll named Five, played by John C. Riley, they travel to find a deserter named Seven, played by Jennifer Connelly, who hates staying safe and thinks exploring and rebelling is the way to take back control. So, hearing this story, you probably put together there's one of two outcomes. This can either have a lot of potential or be another one of the most boring, overused plots in sci-fi history. And again, it's kind of both. Uh, let me explain. You see, it's really hard to stay invested in these characters and what they want. They're not bad or annoying or anything, they're just very one note. One note isn't too bad though, if it can be creatively utilized. I mean, the Nightmare Before Christmas characters aren't exactly the most complex, but you identify with their basic needs. Jack wants to feel challenged and excited, Sally wants to protect the one she loves, the scientist wants to create the perfect companion, you get the idea. Right at the beginning though, Nine's motivations keep changing around. First, it's to find someone. He does. Then that someone is taken away. Okay, let's save him. They save him, but he's quickly destroyed. Okay, um, put this device found earlier in this machine. Oh no, that created a monster. Um, guess find out what made that monster. Okay, did that. Stop the monster. Oh no, the friends are captured. Save them, I suppose. You see the issue? 
That's not to say there aren't clues and bits of foreshadowing that slowly reveal what they are and where they came from, but I don't think even Nine cares that much what he is or where he came from. Half the time I have to remind myself what he's even after at any given moment. Also, there's the look of the film. At the time, it was very unique. Shane Acker did visual effects for some of the biggest epics to ever hit the screen, and for 2009, this is very impressive animation. Also keep in mind this was one of only two animated films from Focus Features that had this dark look. Since then there's been a lot more, but the idea of dark children's-ish films was not a common thing. I say children-ish because the film has a PG-13 rating, and with all the death in it, it's not entirely unwarranted. But now that we do have a lot more dark animated movies, the environment may be a little too dirty and ugly to look at. Don't get me wrong, it has its pretty moments, and the designs themselves are very original. But there's only so long you can look at all this muddy brown and smoky gray and piss yellow. A film can be dark and still be visually interesting to look at, and these environments start to wear on you after a while. But again, that wouldn't be too big a deal if the characters or story were good enough to distract us from it. And like I said, they're pretty cookie cutter. I also discovered I wasn't alone on this. A lot of critics praised the look of the film, but claimed the story and characters really fell short. Some recommended it anyway, but most agreed the main leads were too one-dimensional to get invested in. But here's the thing. There is kind of a reason for that. Okay, in order to talk about this, I have to go into spoilers, which I know I do all the time on this show, but this does have an interesting surprise in the third act, so if you don't want it ruined, go watch the movie and come back to watching this. I'll even give you a commercial break so you can go watch it. The city. It's my city. And what makes it my city? Stamps. Let's face it, taking trips to the post office is probably not how you want to spend your time. That's why I recommend mailing and shipping online at Stamps.com. Because you deserve that city. You deserve Stamps.com. Stamps.com allows you to mail and ship anytime, anywhere, right from your computer. Send letters, ship packages, and pay a lot less with discounted rates from USPS, UPS, and more. You deserve that city. City that looks like a big stamp. If you squint your eyes to where they're clothes. Man, I'm drunk. Stamps.com has saved businesses thousands of hours and tons of money. With Stamps.com, you get the services of the post office and UPS all in one place. Plus big discounts on mailing and shipping rates. Why do my thoughts sound like I'm losing my voice? Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS right to your computer. Stamps.com is a must-have for any business. Whether you're a small office sending out invoices, an online seller shipping out orders, or even a giant warehouse sending thousands of packages a day. Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Sorry, I get really passionate about stamps. <gasps> Rachel! Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. It's that simple. With Stamps.com, you get discounts up to 40% off post office rates and up to 62% off UPS shipping Not rates. to mention, Stamps.com is a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Stamps.com is the hero, not the one you deserve but the one you need. Or is it the other way around? I don't know, like I said, I'm drunk. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, saving you time and money. It's no wonder nearly one million small businesses already use Stamps.com. Got kind of lost on the com there. Gum. Okay, fine. The voice of my thoughts are going. I better get to the special offer. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to Stamps.com instead. Because there's no risk. And with my promo code, Nostalgia, you get a special offer that includes a four week free trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in Nostalgia. That's Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in Nostalgia. For your special offer today. Who am I? I am. Didn't think far enough to give myself a name yet, man. Catchy is Didn't it? Didn't think far enough to give myself a name yet, or whatever I call myself, name man. Says never go to the post office again with stamps.com. Oh, I kind of thought that ad would be an hour, 20 minutes long. Pause it and go watch. Okay, here we go. This is the big reveal in the third act. All the rag dolls are different parts of the scientist's soul. 
You see, he was the creator of the machines that took over the world. He was on the side of what looks like a fascist-esque regime and was making a machine to think for itself and based it on his own intellect. When the regime decides to use it as a weapon, the machine does its job a little too well and wipes out all of humanity. With the scientist being one of the last, if not THE last, human alive, he splits up his soul into nine parts, sacrificing his life in the hopes that maybe these fragments of himself can start anew. Not to sidetrack with another movie, but have you ever seen The Straight Story? It's one of the most boring films ever made. Literally, it's just watching a guy on a riding mower driving for miles to see his dying brother. Yeah, he comes across someone every once in a while, but it's mostly him on this damn thing. But when you get to the end, you realize that was kind of the point. It was supposed to be boring to give you an idea of what this guy went through for the love of his estranged sibling. The rest of the film suddenly changed when you got to this moment. Nine is very similar. The characters are very one note. Well, maybe if you combined all those notes together, you have a complete person. So many of these characters seem like complete opposites. One is more defensive and wants to stay in. Seven is more offensive and wants to venture out. Eight is strong yet does what he's told, maybe a little too much. Six is tiny but thinks outside the box, again, maybe a little too much. The twins, three and four, are very inquisitive and love information, where five is simpler and doesn't question much. If you look at all these characters as different parts of a human being, with nine being the heart at the center, it does kind of make sense. Whenever there's an argument, it's not unsimilar to when a person is debating in his or her mind what to do. One of the things I noticed a lot more watching it again is all the little details. Look at Two's outfit here. There's a part of a pair of glasses, a spoon, a tiny candle, screws, and some wire. You can tell this means they're scavengers and they just put together whatever they can find. When you look at the robotic creatures, you get the idea the machines took dead wildlife and built smaller machines to hunt down what life is left, which probably would be smaller animals, leading to them locating our ragdoll heroes. This is a film whose story is told in the details, and the more you think about it, the more interesting they become. The film ends with the souls of the fallen ragdolls being released into the sky, leaving only Nine, Seven, and the twins left. Now, at first, I didn't enjoy this because I liked the idea of one person's soul coming together to recreate civilization. But then I thought about it more. There is kind of an Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel vibe here. And on top of that, the rain that falls seems to have the essence of the souls that were released, perhaps indicating they will help the world grow in a completely different way. I don't think any of this is direct allegory, but there are a lot of similarities to other creation stories. But that does raise the question, does justifying your characters being one note still make them interesting to watch? I actually thought it would have been more fascinating if the personalities grew other characteristics. We saw a little bit of that with one's character growing more noble and sacrificing himself at the end, but everyone else mostly stays the same. Even the machines, the main antagonists of the film, are kind of generic. Oh, not the animal ones, they're pretty damn cool. God, they're scary. I'm talking about the lead baddies. I mean, look at them. They're every Matrix, Skynet, War of the Worlds boring blah. They never talk or have personality, which again, could be okay if the main characters made up for that. And even then, I think that problem could have been solved if they just added a little more humor. Little moments like Seven swinging in to save the day, missing and saying, Let me try that again. Or Nine telling One to let go of his cape to save his life, and he says, You owe me a cape. <clears throat> Those scenes are cute and add a lot of personality. But there's basically no humor throughout the rest of this, and a lot of these characters are so wide-eyed and curious that there could have been a lot of great comedy to endear us to them more. For all the opportunities they take up in the idea department, they don't take up nearly as much in the entertaining department. Something like Terminator 2 doesn't have nearly as complex ideas, but they do have likable characters. If we could somehow combine this film's personality with this film's concepts, I really think we could have had a great emotional work of art. So, is Nine a good movie? I think it depends on how you see it and when you see it. I remember not getting into the idea, so I paid more attention to the visuals. Now, it's switched. I love the idea and the visuals are a little bit more standard. 
Instead of loving the big picture, I get into the details. Rather than enjoying the cast, I like the one character they add up to. The narrative is not the most gripping, but what it amounts to has endless possibilities. Even though I don't love movies like this, I have a deep respect for them. Because even though they stay the same, our perception of them changes. As we grow older and become different people, the exact same movie can look totally different. And I'm really glad I came back to this film to analyze the deeper meanings it could have. Do I think it works as a whole? No. But what does work, I am glad I saw. I can easily see why there's so many film theories about this flick, as it leaves it open to different interpretations. Is it as complex and abstract as, say, Eraserhead or 2001? I don't think I can go that far, but I'd compare it to something like Matrix or Dark City. Films that can get the ball rolling for young minds to start questioning reality and how film represents it. Whether the movie is aware of how many ideas it did or didn't have, I'm not sure but it's left vague enough for people to read deeper into it than perhaps we gave credit for when it first came out. So whether you find it a masterpiece, boring as hell, or something in between, go ahead and let me know what this film meant to you, if you have any theories about it, and what you think the future holds for its legacy. I'm a nostalgia critic, guy, remember, so you don't have to. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out. Uh, this one is another recommendation, so thank you uh, so much for that. And thanks everyone that's been uh, sending in the recommendations. And this one's really cool. It's called uh, Cuddly. Uh, Kelly, uh, Cuddly helps give all animals a healthy life and a loving home. They enable animal rescues to create fundraisers and wish lists to support animals in their care. With over 2,000 plus animal welfare organizations on board, Cuddly's mission is to help save as many many animals globally through community, innovation, and creativity. As a company, they believe the best way for us to make an impact is by providing the business tools, namely fundraising, marketing, and a valuable community, to animal-focused nonprofits so they can fulfill their potential and continue to do good. Uh, so this is a really, really uh, cool idea. I really like the way it's kind of trying something a little different. And uh, you can check out the site and uh, see, I mean, they have like the stats like on the the front page of like how many they've held and money raised and stuff like that so they do really really uh good work uh go check them out and uh, if you can't donate spread the word just you know spread the word about all the good that uh, so many people do so thank you so much and take care